Greetings, everyone. This is Jackie Lukeman. And I'm Uncle Baba Lukeman. And we're a little late and a little frenzied. <laughs> a few technical difficulties that seem to plague us this week, but oh. we you know, here. We's here. We's here. We's here. Yep. And welcome to it's actually episode four of Imprint uh, of Imperialism, uh, where we have our weekly discussion. Uh, uh, monthly, I should say, sorry, not weekly, monthly discussion um, about uh, the imprint of imperialism on the continent mm -hmm. uh, of Africa and, you know, expanding uh, throughout the world a little bit. Uh, I need to make one adjustment, making sure everything is everything. Uh, let me make everything sure is everything. Everything. Yeah. There we go. I think I think that's a little better in the audio department. I hope so. So, look, y'all. We appreciate you so much as always. Um, thanks for joining us here on Dope Friday Date Night. Yep. Uh, first Fridays. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, my tagline. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the most dangerous show on social media on the most dangerous platform on social media. Mm -hmm. Now we um. You know, last week, you know, we kind of got a slap on our wrist, you know. Um, you know, last week we went out of town. Um, yes. You know, it was my birthday week. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we tried to leave y'all a little something, something with the, um, with the. Uh, uh, the cipher. The cipher. Yeah, there it is. The cipher. Um, so, you know, so um, we hope that you enjoyed that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, um, you know, um, my daughter, I was talking to my daughter yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, she asked me. Um, you know, because now, you know, with the 100th anniversary of, of the, you know, uh, the Tulsa, um, uh, you know, incident, mm -hmm. uh, race, you know, racial incident, mm -hmm. um, you know, she said, well, dad, she said, did you see it? And I said, no, I haven't seen, you know, because now she said the History Channel has it. Mm -hmm. CNN's been, um, you know, running it, you know, right. the, you know, so I told her, I said, no, I said, I, you know, of course, I've seen plenty of documentaries <laughs> on it. But I said, I told her, I said, no, I haven't really watched it. And I'm going to be honest with you, Jackie. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult for me. I, um, Like I said, it's not that I'm unaware of it. I've watched documentaries of it in the past. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, with everything that's been going on in the last couple of years, um, just coming off this George Floyd thing, yeah. um, you know, the continuing assaults that we um, face as, as a people, um, you know, um, not just by the police, but by government, mm -hmm. um, even by each other, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, it's like, I just couldn't see any more black death, you know, yeah. you know, I, I just, I just, you know, I, I, I said, okay, I, maybe eventually I'll get to it. But I said, but right now, you know, I'm kind of like when it comes yeah. to just black bodies and black death and, yeah. you know, I just had to just step back a little bit from that. Yeah. I mean, and we've been talking about this as we've been, you know, because usually Friday night after we get mm. done with the show, we get a good, you know, bad for us snack. Yeah, yeah. You it's know? our cheat, our cheat is day. It, this, is, this is our Friday yeah. is our cheat dinner. So um, we, you know, eat whatever we want, you know, for, mm. for tonight. And, and we find something good to watch on television. There's been a lot of these documentaries, you know, um, and then a lot of um, other kinds of shows. Mm -hmm about you know uh um uh, um uh, enslaved people right, escaping right. slavery right. and 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 that kind of stuff so it's not just about you know Tulsa mm -hmm. but that but this is like kind of been the thing that we've been struggling with um with trying to find entertainment that right, is right. not centered around um the trauma of black people right. and and I feel like some of this stuff needs to exist because there are people who need to see it. Mm -hmm. I just feel like those people ain't us. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like, 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 you know, uh, you go on Netflix or you go on some of these streaming channels and they have a whole section of, um, you know, some of them call them black voices or black this or black that. Mm -hmm. And it's just all this, gee, I'm black stuff. You know, <laughs> you know it, it, I mean, that, that, yeah, that's how I call it. It's like, oh, gee, I'm black. Gee, I'm black. Oh God, yeah, I'm black. <laughs> and like you said, I mean, look, you can get too much of anything. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that sometimes, you know, well, for me, I'll speak for me. Sometimes I have to, you know, really limit myself 
when it comes to because I because the way that affects me affects me emotionally. Yeah. And you know, and sometimes you know, I have to sometimes like limit that. Um, it's like I said, it's not that you're denying it. It's not that you're not aware of what's going on. But I mean, um, you know, uh, I mean, we live in an area where we constantly hear gunshots. Mm -hmm. um, we know mm -hmm. we're living in a city now where you know black, mur you know, um, black murder rate is, um, you know, it's 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 high. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I just read somewhere, Jackie, like in Philly, there. I mean, it's it's June, and they're already approaching six hundred murders. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and when we when we look at. And we were having this conversation today on by any means necessary because mm. we had Dr. CBS on, oh. uh, who again follows this show uh, with the last dope intellectual her show. Right. And if you can catch it, also please catch uh, uh, Burn It Down with Kim Brown on uh, her channel, uh, and I think she will be importing her mm. show on the Black Power Media. Um, but you, you got to check that out. I think right now we're trying to work out the schedule, right? Right. Because right, I think right. we come on at the same time as Kim and. You know, this is a collective of African voices. Yeah, so what yeah. we don't want to do is step on each other's toes. Right. We definitely want to big each other up and promote each other's stuff and support each other because that's what collectives and communities do. Um, but we were talking about Tulsa mm -hmm. and the way, you know, um, politicians are paying attention to it now. Right, and, right, right. And, you know, the, the, the entertainment industry is making these documentaries. Right, and I'm, right, right. I'm sure some of them are pretty good, but none of them what really... What is good about a documentary see, in Tulsa? Well, that, that, you know, I, mean, I mean, you know, I, and I know where you're going with it. I, I but get it's like, it. I but, get but it. It's, it's like, you know, what, what, what could be good? I, that, that's, <laughs> I, you know what? That's a good point. You know, Thank you for that. Because it's like, yeah, now that I think about it, I don't think there's anything good no, about it. No, no, it's just it's just what it it's is. It's just what it is. Yeah. But, okay, but then but then there's the thing that we were talking about about the way, and this is a, this is a something that that I've had a problem with with the way we talk about Tulsa for mm -hmm. a long time. We always focus on Black Wall Street, right? Right. right, right. As if the only thing that is it that existed and that people are mourning the destruction of were black businesses in right, that community. Right, right, right. When it turns out, I mean, which we knew this intellectually, logically, I, I know that we knew mm. this, that most of the people, most of the black people who lived in Greenwood weren't business owners. There were some businesses. Yes. But most of the people who lived in Greenwood were working class and poor folks yeah. who worked for mostly white people. Right. And right. it was their money that, funded mm -hmm. these black businesses because right, see they right. could work for white people but white people didn't want them doing business in the in their town yeah so i feel like it it's 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 a it's a disservice we disrespect the uh the the true nature of not the true nature. We disrespect the totality of the community that was destroyed mm -hmm. by only focusing on Black Wall Street, the business part. Right, right. And and completely ignoring the working class and poor, poor black folks. Right. right. Um, which, I mean, we, we have kind of participated in this erasure of working class and poor, poor black folks yeah. in Greenwood. Yeah. Um, and because we focus on Tulsa as like the... But why do you think that is? I mean, why why do you think? Because it's not just Tulsa, right? I mean, um, in other uh, so called black townships, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you know we talk about Tulsa, but what we should remember is is that this happened all over the country. Right. Tulsa was right. one of many, uh, you know, uh, all black communities that were that were that was assaulted mm -hmm. um, by white mobs just going in and just acting all willy nilly. But um, but but I think you hit on something here about the focus not just on by white people but by us mm -hmm. like the focus on the 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 class like, like the, the 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 um the focusing on the class distinction mm -hmm. so where we 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 big up the the capitalist part of it right right like, um because i know when i first heard about of uh, uh, black wall street i remember it was a famous um well i, I won't say famous but a well known meme that was going around like in the early days of Facebook. Mm -hmm. And they would list all the stuff that Black Wall Street had. Oh, they had uh, an airport. Right. Uh, right. They, you know, um, they had 27 <laughs> planes, right. a, a movie theater, uh, you know, a, a rocket launcher. You know? 
It was like all of this stuff, but you know, and they was like, oh, they had this and they had that. Right. And you know, and 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 hey, look, I, you know, I imagine most of that was true. But it, you know, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but well, not the rocket launcher. <laughs> but you know, but you know, they was like, oh, they had this and they had that. Right. Well, a lot of it was out of necessity because we couldn't use white folks stuff. Right. So you right. know, so it was out of necessity we had to have our own hospitals and stuff. Exactly. But, but at the same time, I do feel that it is sort of something that is really um, uh, um, in, indicative of this society or, mm -hmm. or Western society mm -hmm. as far as making these class distinctions um, to say that, well, you know, Tulsa is horrible because look what they did to these type of people. Right. Right. So, you know, exactly. And, and, and you ask the question, why, why is that done? I think it ties to uh, imperialism, which remember Lenin, uh, uh, analyzed is the highest form of capitalism. Right. And what we see being done on the continent of Africa and other places around mm. the world, like we're seeing in Colombia and in Brazil and in uh, uh, the Americas, uh, where people, working class and poor people and other marginalized people, women, LGBTQ, right, right. trans people, are rising up against neoliberal um, um, uh, oppressive mm. systems that are, are, are driven by uh, Western imperialism, right. um, I think it's the same thing that it, it's connected to the same thing. It, it is this focus on capitalism being more right. important, capital being more important. And those people who are involved in it. And that. those people who are involved right. in capital, driving capital, the capitalists. Right, right. Um, they're more important than you know the destruction of a sharecropper's life. Well, uh, you and, know? And, and you and, and you mentioned that um, the Elaine massacre. Exactly. You know, I mean, you hardly ever hear that being talked about, but that was even worse than um, uh, Tulsa. I mean, it was it you was know, I mean, because it involved far, right, because it involved right. the U.S. military, exactly. and you know, it invo it involved a bunch of working class and poor right, people. So right, I right. think the reason we are seeing, I think it's. It, it, it's it's a double edged sword with the with the focus on on Tulsa. It's good that it's happening because right. there are only three survivors of that uh, yeah, racist right. wh you know white uh, racist terrorist. And uh, I'm glad uh, that God Pope spared Warren them left. in order to tell the story, right? Because they'll say that you know we're exaggerating. Exactly, they, that, they, you know? they were there. They they survived right. it. So it's a good thing that that it's being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, we have to. Uh, challenge and deconstruct these myths mm. that even we have propped up about Black Wall Street. We're not, we're not, we're not saying to focus on any of these white supremacist uh, terrorist actions because businesses were lost, right, because right, right. capital was, you know, because black people who were able to make a profit and prosper were lost. No, we're saying that they all need to be focused mm -hmm. on because it is a part of the racist history of this country that is tied to the settler colonial project that more that led to capitalism and eventually imperialism right. that we see around the world. And and you know, and Tulsa is just one example of um black wealth that's just been destroyed by white people being angry about it. You know, I, you know, um you know, being angry about black wealth or black people being able to accumulate wealth under the most adverse circumstances in the capitalist society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it doesn't fit the myth, it doesn't fit right. the narrative, you know? Right. And so, you know, and we can go back to the Freedmen's Bank when mm -hmm. white folks just took that money and, oh, uh, you know, just the way we've been defrauded out of our wealth and right. continue to this day with the um, erroneous um, house, housing appraisals. And, right, right. That cost right. black people, you know, a, a, a lot of wealth. You a know? lot. And and then to that point, and then we're gonna have to leave it at that yeah. point because we have our, our, yeah. our guest here. To that point, what you just said, um, it, th this is why framing the 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 racist uh, uh, terrorist attack on Greenwood should not be framed as just Black Wall Street being destroyed. It's because whatever remedy mm -hmm. this capitalist society. Um, decides to implement right. because of that will always be based in capitalism. This is why Biden's response to, well, we need to do something to, you know, fix this. This is why his idea of reparative justice is to focus on more grants right, for black businesses. Right, right, right. This is, see, th this is why we can't frame the 
history of racist terrorism against black people and the theft of our resources mm-hmm. and the theft of our wealth as purely capitalistic. And why does that matter? Because we were just talking about, and I'm glad we had Milton, um, mm-hmm. uh, Brother Milton, because Namibia, oh. right? Um, we were just talking about, mm-hmm. you and I, not too long ago, about the German government's response to, um, uh, I, I can't remember, Milton could probably The Herrero it. people. Yeah, the Herrero uh-huh. people, right. And how, you know, instead of um, really doing the right thing, like they did with Israel, uh-huh. you know, um, uh you know, they, you know, the German government said that, um, well, we're just going to invest in infrastructure, which means <laughs> shit. It means I mean, let's, let's be honest with you. It means nothing. It means oh, we're just going to invest nothing. in infrastructure. What does that mean? <laughs> we're going to build you a hospital. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, a dog park or something like that. <laughs> but, you know, but it, it's still when you're dealing with the when the when we're still dealing with um, the, the injustices that were suffered by um, uh, many African peoples, um, you know, by the European. It's always this, and and include us in that. Mm-hmm. It's always this this um, a, approach of well, you Negroes don't know how to handle money, right? So you know, right, right, right. so it's it's still the great white father <laughs> coming in here saying, okay, we did you wrong. This is, but this is the way it should be this done. Is the way, right, it right, right. So done. anyway, you right. We spent a lot of time on this, and we can't even get to your monologue, man. We supposed to get to your monologue today, but well, that's okay. That, but but I think it's good to announce that that's going to be something right, we're going to start right, doing right, from right. now on. Uh, we're going to start our show with uh, my monologue from right. By Any Means Necessary that I do. Because it's some good um, shit. <laughs> yeah. Some real good shit. Well, thank you. That's, it is. that's a glowing endorsement. <laughs> well, you know what? That's, like we that's said, my, that's for the <laughs> like we said, we are always, always happy to be joined by uh, Brother Milton <laughs> Alamadi, our comrade and our uh, just our friend, yeah, our friend and our just comrade. an amazing journalist and historian and thank you so much for joining us my pleasure my pleasure i was really enjoying the conversation (laughs) (laughs) after said you can't walk on water he's a wonderful guy but 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 you know didn't know he can't walk on water (laughs) no you're you're speaking truth to power i was really learning a lot from that Wow, wow. Milton Alamadi said he was learning a lot from us. That's um Donna. all right. You're on top of the game. Jesus, you can taste it now. <laughs> all right, so um so should I start or should you start? So yeah, because you, you started start, with really Namibia. Bad. Yeah, I did start with Namibia. But I wanted to say actually you made a very good point, Jacqueline. Mm-hmm. In terms of the celebration and glorification of capital. And yes, of course, I want maximum attention to the Tulsa massacre. I think uh, our European American sisters and brothers need to know about that. They need to be reminded of many other atrocities carried out in the past. And so in that respect, yes, the publicity I endorse, but I also agree with you that it's really disingenuous to focus just on uh, people that had amassed some capital, mm-hmm. because then that is sending the signal that this is the definition of success. You know, to be successful in this society, you need to own your business, right? You need to be a capitalist, mm-hmm. and that is why this tragedy in Tulsa was so uniquely tragic. And forget about all the other lives snuffed out all the other African lives snuffed out in this country. So now you're creating that dichotomy that these folks in Tulsa were special because they had succeeded as capitalists. (laughs) And therefore their lives were much more valuable compared to Africans in this country who never succeeded as capitalists. And that's very dangerous, of course. And not a lot of people are thinking like that. So that is why what you said is very profound. I hope you write a column about it or an article. We'd be very happy to well, <laughs> very happy to publish that and promote it widely. Because now as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, yes, wait a minute. What about the uh, the black farmers? That's right. Who mm-hmm. lost 90% of their land. To me, that would be a much more dramatic documentary. Mm. I'm not taking anything away from Tulsa. I think what they went through is just 
unbelievable in that European Americans and our own sisters and brothers need to know about that. Too many of us don't even know about that. Right. That mm -hmm. That's right. Were, were bombed, you know, bombs thrown from airplane dropped on their buildings. Imagine. And as they're fleeing, they were massacred in the streets. Yes. Right. This happened in the so-called United States of America. And how is it that this is not part of every curriculum in this country? So that mm -hmm. everyone needs to know about it. You know? So I'm yeah. very glad I, I heard, you know, what you were saying, because in all the discussions I've been hearing, I've never quite heard it put that way. Well, you know, thank you very much for, for that compliment, Milton. And, and to your point about writing an article, I'm actually not going to write an article about it. You know why? Why? Because someone already did. Okay. <laughs> and he's actually in the chat. Okay. Two Black. Wrote, oh, Two Black. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yes. Two okay. Black wrote That's this great article that is published in Hood Communist. Mm. Uh, our comrades, Erica Kane oh. and Onyu yeah. Son Wu Chatoye and uh, uh, Salafu Sese Mac yes. and, yep. and folks over at Hood Communist, I'm going to share. Uh, yeah. This article, and of course, I'm going to drop it uh, in the chat for you. Excellent, please do. Uh, but I'm this like is uh, I'm in touch with. yeah, definitely. I'm going to drop it in the chat for everyone. But this is published in this week's Hood Communist. Uh, it's called "From Black Wall Street to Black Capitalism." As I said, it's written by two black. It speaks to these very issues we mm. were talking about, and this is actually the article, one of the articles that we were referencing today when we were having this conversation okay. with okay. Dr. Sharice Burton Stelly on by any means necessary. So I'm going to drop this in here for y'all. Thank you, Hood Communist and Two Black for that beautiful piece of work. So Very good. yes, Namibia. 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 Yeah. Namibia is uh it shows you how far we are still from the end of the liberation struggle in, uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. in, in Namibia, we actually have in the constitution, it's written that the land cannot be seized and the land cannot be given to the Africans whose ancestors were massacred and then the land taken by Europeans whose descendants own the land today, many of them are absentee landlords. They're not even in Namibia, wow. they're in Europe, they're in Germany, they're in England, wherever they are. Yet the land remains there, it's their land. Namibia has a tremendously growing population, like most African countries, young people, educated or not educated, but not having a means of uh, supporting themselves or livelihood, but they can't touch this land. And Namibia can't do anything about it, the Namibian government, unless they have a revolution, of course. But if they're to follow the constitution, they can't do anything about it. Wow. Wow, there's because an R word again, revolution. Yep. <laughs> the constitution prohibits them from land reform, you see? And that's why their hands are tied up. And the young people in Namibia, like the young people in South Africa, are just saying, forget the constitution. We had no party writing that constitution anyway. Mm -hmm. All we know is that and once belonged to our forefathers. And then Europeans came from Germany and they seized the land and they killed our ancestors and they took over the land. So why should we be constrained by some piece of paper. Right. Hmm. Yeah. And that is a challenge. It's very, it's a potentially very explosive. I'm surprised that it has not yet already uh, resulted in violence. I imagine because the security forces are enforcing those landlords, land laws, mm -hmm. pro protecting the European quote unquote ownership of that land. And that is why Zimbabwe was punished severely to set an example because they did not want the Zimbabwe model under Robert Mugabe mm -hmm. set a, uh, a, an example to South Africa and to Namibia 
and even to Kenya. Kenya, we don't talk a lot about Kenya, but Kenya, <laughs> the European absentee landlords who are now in Britain also hold millions of acres in Kenya. Wow. In addition to the president, of course, the president in Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, probably owns about half the country <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of arable land. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because, of course, he's, uh, he's Uhuru Kenyatta, is the son of Jomo Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. And at independence, Jomo Kenyatta essentially forgot the folks who are fighting in the forest, the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, which the British had dismissed and given that derogative term, Mau Mau. They became mm. Mau Mau. But they didn't call themselves that. They had a name. The name was called the Kenya Land and Freedom Army. So they knew exactly what they were fighting for. <laughs> right, right, right. Wow. And now when Kenya won independence in 63, Jomo Kenyatta shook hands with the European British. And they basically said, okay, you're our man in Kenya. And he was actually now given the task of suppressing the sentiments, the re revolutionary sentiments that the Mau Mau, as the British call them, had inspired uh, amongst Kenyans. He became their enforcer and accumulated a lot of land. And he had a falling out with uh, uh, Odinga Oginga, who was a socialist, the mm -hmm. father of current uh, opposition leader, Raila Odinga. He was a committed socialist. He wrote this book that I think I recommended before, Not Yet Uhuru. Mm -hmm. I strongly recommend mm -hmm. that book. That was a brother was a serious socialist. He had it all mapped out in terms of how the land should be redistributed. Because you know, in Kenya, the Europeans right. took over 4 million acres of land, mostly from the Kikuyu, kicked them off the land, turned them into literally like serfs. Now, had them working <laughs> for Europeans on okay. land that yesterday yeah, belonged right. to Africa. Wow. Gave 4 million acres to 1,000 European families only. Think about Four that. 4 million acres? acres? For about a penny an acre, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, so that was the situation in Kenya. So it's Kenya, it's uh, primarily Kenya, Namibia, and South Africa, that the uh, land issue is remains very explosive. Mm. Um, so, Milton, we already have a question uh, in the chat. And Shirley asks, what stops the people from taking back their land? Are they afraid the West yep. will impose some kind of sanctions Absolutely. or send military forces? 100%. The person that posed the question answered the question precisely as well. <laughs> Remember, when in Zimbabwe, when the land was uh, given back to Africans, the British were infuriated. And the British, you know, a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> After the Lancaster settlement, right? Mm -hmm. 1980, the British had committed to providing the money to buy the land from the Europeans. Mm. The United States also agreed to be a part of the process. Well, when, uh, when Jimmy Carter was still president, mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter was involved in the negotiations, Andy Young, um, uh, Andrew Young was involved in the negotiations, and that was the commitment. Right. Because the Zimbabweans said, why should we take public funds to buy land from Europeans in Zimbabwe when they stole the land from Africa? Mm -hmm. So all the British said, okay, this is reasonable. So they committed to providing the money. That money never came. So and some people said, well, you know, maybe Robert Mugabe used the excuse of the land thing as, a, as a, an excuse because by that time he was becoming less popular and all that. Regardless whether that's true or not, the land issue had to be resolved at some point. Right, right. Mm. The money was not coming from the British. Therefore, it wasn't coming from the United States either because the U.S. goes along with what the British uh, say. You see? So, mm. that, so Zimbabwe took that route. And Zimbabwe, when Zimbabwe took that route, Tony Blair was meeting with the uh, leaders in the neighboring African countries. 
and trying to convince them to support an invasion of, wow. of Zimbabwe. Think about that. They right, went, right. They went to Tabombeki. When Tabombeki was, you know, Tabombeki, for whatever faults Tabombeki may have, Tabombeki is a committed Pan African and mm. said, there's no way are we going to invade a, a, a brother or sister African country. <laughs> it won't happen. Right. The British didn't like that. And, you know, subsequently you started hearing all those stories about Tabumbeki, you know, mm -hmm. was uh, the denier of, uh, of HIV AIDS and all that. He started being projected as, as a lunatic in a lot right. of media. But the real reason was because of his stance of not supporting an invasion of uh, Zimbabwe. And then, so that is part of the answer that the person that posed the question. Also and we knew, Milton, that when um, Robert Mugabe did do that, he was, um, Zimbabwe was hit heavy with economic sanctions. Absolutely. I mean, and the second thing. ruined the economy. Absolutely. And that also goes back to the answer that the question I actually provided, the financial retribution. Up to today, years after Mugabe is no longer in power, Mugabe has already joined the ancestors. Those mm -hmm. still remain today. That's wow. right. Because the goal is that you must return the land to the Europeans, which is preposterous. It cannot happen. You know, it cannot happen because any government that does that will face the wrath of Africans in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. you know? So they're being completely unrealistic and punitive. They were not willing to impose some san such sanctions when Zimbabwe was still Rhodesia, mm -hmm. being ruled under the apartheid white regime of Ian Smith. Mm -hmm. They never had such debilitating sanctions, but look at what they've done to uh, Zimbabwe today. So that... Well, um, mm -hmm. Because they, they, Zimbabwe was taken as a, as, a, as, a, as a test case. Let's show South Africa what would happen to them. Right. Mm. They take this approach. Mm -hmm. Let's show Namibia what will happen to them if they take that approach. And Namibia is very conscious of that. Mm. And, um, and that is why they don't want to unilaterally just uh, seize the land and redistribute to Africa. But I think what we need to do is have more of this kind of conversation that we're having. We need the public in countries such as the United States, Britain, Germany, these countries to know how completely unfair mm -hmm. and outright criminal these policies that they're enforcing against African countries are. Because there are some elements in these countries that we can persuade them to be a little more reasonable, you right. see? But when there's total ignorance, then the Africans have no allies. You know, they don't have allies when even people in our own communities here in the United States don't know. <laughs> Many mm -hmm. systems don't know the issues about the land. The land is this primary issue, I would say, the land in Africa, and then the resources, of course, and then the, because people think African countries are independent, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have African president. <laughs> and African right. president. Right. But they're not. They're not. These are essentially European governors in African skin. Mm. That is the most dangerous part because when there were outright Europeans, we could be outraged and organize and protest. And people here in the US would understand right. how can Uganda or Kenya or Tanzania have a European running the country as a colony. No. So we could mobilize people to fight that. But now today, you have so-called African presidents and prime ministers. Europeans have found that that is the best solution. In fact, it is even better than outright colonialism. Right, <laughs> right. Wow, yeah. I mean, for them, yeah. Yeah, because they them. don't have to literally be there. Right. To... You see? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You enjoy all the privileges of colonialism, mm -hmm. while you can't you cannot be accused of mm. being a colonial power anymore when you have a Museveni in Uganda. Right, right. Mm. 
Right. Well, when you have, I'll tell you. Go ahead, brother. No, no, no. I'm going to let you finish your thought. When you have a Museveni in Uganda, when you have a, a Kenyatta in Kenya, when you have a, uh, a Muhammad Debi in Chad, just took over from his father, when you have uh, uh, this military guy in uh, Mali, Asimi, Goita, mm -hmm. Mali, just, uh, just overthrew uh, the transitional government that he himself had put in place. And they're all Africans. Yeah. Right. Least, when we see them, we, we look and we see Africans, right? But as you know, even in this country, we can find sisters and brothers who are more reactionary than Europeans. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. so we have those examples in African countries too. And that is a challenge. And that is why we have to be very creative when we mobilize opposition to neocolonialism in Africa. Well, um, we're going to get with, we're going to uh, get to Mali, uh, Milton, mm -hmm. before the show. But since we're down the southern end of the continent, yes. um, I wanted to just go into South Africa. And there appears to be um, uh, President um, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa seems to be having his hands full down there um, mm -hmm. with them trying to root out corruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and, and could you not only get into that, but what is this with South African politics where they're actually killing their opponents? Um, because um, there was something that I read about right. um, the murder, um, well, the, the alleged um, killing murder of um, Mduzi uh, um, Medikizela. Right. Well, in South Africa, uh, and there are many explanations, of course. First of all, we have to look at the, the maldistribution of resources the maldistribution of uh, of power, and uh, you know, again, and, and the, the the way the economy, economy essentially, has not been altered since the official end of apartheid. So you have the same issues and the same kind of uh, criminality that we had during the apartheid regime that still uh, exists today. And of course, during the apartheid regime, it was a bit easier because you you had like the the white beneficiaries mm -hmm. uh, controlling the armed forces of the police and using that to suppress any black you know uprising or dissent mm. while maintaining and protecting uh, white privilege. Right. So now today, you have white privilege in alliance with the new African elite who were empowered after the official end of apartheid. So essentially what the apartheid regime did was what the Europeans did, the former colonials, they selected their partners in African countries. So people like uh, John Kenyatta became uh, a partner of Europe. And any, any African leader for that matter became a partner of Europe. The only very few who did not want to stay on the plantation, like Lumumba, like Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. like uh, Sankara. And of course, we know how it ended up <laughs> for, right. for all of them. Right. right. So in South Africa, people like, including Ramaphosa himself, Ramaphosa is a billionaire. You wow. see, not, not even in South African rand. He's a billionaire in United States dollars. Wow. Get out of here. <laughs> How did, he amass, how, how, how did he amass that type of wealth? How did he amass that type of wealth, Milton? Yes, and that's how he made it. He made his wealth by being selected that, you know, this is our man. So he became, they put him on the boards of all these uh, huge mineral conglomerates, these mm. big multinational companies. He became a shareholder, a board member in, in, in many of these companies. And that is how he amassed his wealth. And that is wow. why that is, that is why he literally condoned. Um, you remember the Marikana massacre when they killed the miners? Yes. You know, he was on on the a board member of that of, of uh, that British company. Uh, you know, he's a board member, so he's benefited from the spilling of blood. So South Africa, 
when we look at the, what's going on, rather than looking the, at the micro individual incidents, I look at it from a broader perspective. The South mm -hmm. Africa is now living out what uh, Steve Biko warned against. There's a very brief uh, interview with Biko. I think it's about 20 or 24 minutes. And if you anybody goes to YouTube, just put Steve Biko interview, and you'll see that interview. He's being interviewed by a European journalist. And he warned, and he said, if in South Africa, if we have only the the after apartheid, after if we have only the change in the in the in the in the rulers, we replace Africans, we replace Europeans rather with Africans and nothing else, then nothing will change. Mm. It will be apartheid now being administered by black people. Right. He said, in order to change in South Africa, we need a fundamental change in the ownership of the resources. You know, we need to nationalize the land, uh, the major banks and insurance companies, and the mines. We need a fundamental redistribution of resources. And whether we do some of it in conjunction with some private enterprise, which is state control or state directed, that's what we need to do. And that's the only solution. And that's not been done in South Africa. That has not been done. And the land is still more than 70% uh, owned by the Europeans in South Africa who make up less than 8% 8, 8 of the population. So to me, these are the fundamental challenges rather than the, you know, the daily incidents that are just uh, manifestations of the bigger malady in South Africa. And so when we, they talk about you know, fighting corruption, it's very hard to see that a billionaire president is going to be really that motivated to fight corruption. You know? <laughs> right, right. The same about conversations it. we have here right. about all those right. billionaires in Congress not yeah. caring about our issues. You see how this stuff connects? Exactly. Yeah. But Bill, let me ask you something about um, everything that you stated. Um, wasn't the um, the ANC, wasn't they supposed to, um, when they took control of the government, wasn't this their platform? Um, okay. what, what has happened to them? Well, it's still on the platform, the Freedom Charter, which is a brilliant document, of course, and which outlines a lot of the things that uh, Steve Biko was also speaking about. Really, it's a beautiful uh, document, and you know, you, people can look it up online. But the Freedom Charter has not been implemented, mm. you know, because, of course, Mandela was in his 70s already. And I have, I've always been uh, very supportive that I'm, I'm glad that he did not die behind bars. Right. I was glad that he was freed, partly, of course, because South Africa took a big beating in Angola by the Cuban soldiers in 1987. And they realized that, wait a minute, we can actually lose on the battlefield to non-European army. Mm -hmm. And that's why they released Mandela and they got the deal that obviously benefits capital as a result. But uh, I think it was obvious that Mandela hoped and believed that the young generation would continue the struggle uh, because Mandela stated explicitly in the Rivonia trial and that also is available on, on YouTube. The audio actually is available. It's a remarkable, remarkable speech. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably uh, condensed a little. It's about 40 to 45 minutes. And Rivonia trial, for listeners not familiar with the spellings, R-I-V-O-N-I-A. And that was the treason trial where it was condemned to life in prison. But I understand the plan was actually to give him the death sentence and have him executed. But I understand even the judge was compelled by what he heard. He didn't hide anything. He said, did I right. rebel and fight against the state? He said, yes, I did. But why? 
because we had exhausted all other measures. And even when I decided to take up arms, I didn't just do it recklessly and armlessly. I read Mao Zedong. I read Clausewitz. He listed all the people that had written books about warfare. And then, of course, you know, he went and he trained in Algeria with the FNL, guerrillas. Right. And he said he did everything in order, reason, well calculated. And why did he decide to finally take up arms? And then he started listing, listing, uh, listing the inequities right. that existed in South Africa, the malnutrition rate, mm -hmm. the education, the infant mortality. And then they add upon that the overall humiliation of being a grown black man and having to be tre treated like a boy, like mm -hmm. a white person, you know. At the end of the day, which African in his right mind would not rebel and fight against the system? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So even these reactionary European judges listening to it, you know, realize that, you know, he's speaking truth to power. All right, right. so you know, I'm saying all this now. I'm saying all this because the Mandela of 1990 in the 70s now was not the same Mandela that made that speech. Uh -huh. But if conditions in South Africa inspired a Mandela of 1962-63, those conditions still exist today. It means sooner or later, we're going to find uncompromising young Africans in South Africa who are going to push the struggle to its logical conclusion. I mean, of course, the Economic Freedom Fighters Party, you know, they've already done a lot. In fact, the ANC would not be talking about land reform right. if it was mm -hmm. for the Economic Freedom Fighters. You see? Mm -hmm. Somebody put in a question about the Pan-Africanist Congress. Yes. You know, the leader, uh, uh, Sobuke, was killed. Uh, Sobuke was killed. He was, Sobuke was actually, um, one of the preeminent leaders of the struggle in South Africa. And I think he's not given enough, enough uh, uh, kudos and recognition. Uh, he's uh, overshadowed, of course, by the publicity to the ANC. So Bukwe was uncompromising. He wanted all the leadership to, of the struggle of the uh, PAC to mm -hmm. be African and African-led. He believed that that was the only way to maintain really the, the discipline and instill the kind of commitment that uh, was lacking among the African population because they had been conditioned under apartheid to feel inferior, an mm -hmm. inferiority complex. Right. That was why uh, his party <clears throat> took that position and was different from the ANC, which, was, which of course was multinational a uh, multi multiracial and the PAC said that the the tendency is always at the end to play second fiddle when you have an organization that is multi uh, ethnic multinational in a situation such as South Africa's and that's why they took that position he was very mm -hmm. fit he organized that the the boycott of the passes the internal passport that right. Africans were mandated to carry in South Africa. And the, the plan was to come with the passes and then burn the passes in front of the police stations mm -hmm. and submit to being arrested. Mass arrest, just overwhelm the system. You know, bring thousand people, say, okay, arrest all of us. Right. And then, of course, the police opened fire mm -hmm. and we ended up with the Soweto massacre you know, in 1960, he was the organizer of that. And then after that, and he was a, he was a university professor at that time, or a, a lecturer as they call them in South Africa. He was uh, fired, of course, and then he was placed under house arrest, first in prison and then uh, afterwards placed in confinement, not allowed to travel uh, beyond a certain zone around his house. And uh, you know, basically, that's how he, he died and has largely been forgotten in the history of the struggle. And his contribution has been somewhat un, uh, uh, diminished. So I'm glad the listener uh, made out that point. 
But I say all this to say that the struggle has really not be, not yet begun in, in South Africa. Mm. And in, 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 in most African countries, you know, mm -hmm. most African countries are not yet independent. And I see a possibility that the youth ultimately will throw out the neo-colonial uh, enforcers, I call them, in Africa, maintained by the West and the World Bank. And now many of them are getting a lot of resources from China as well. So China, mm -hmm. capital from China is also now maintaining them, get rid of them. And, mm -hmm. they, and you know, because the masses ultimately are the ones that uh, push for the end of colonialism in Africa. In the first place, right. you see, right. a lot of the elite were asking for reform. They wanted to mm -hmm. be ministers in the government as well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but sure. it was the people when they saw the mass support, then they started demanding, you know, independence. Mm -hmm. Many of them, not all, Nkrumah, from the get go, wanted independence. Mm -hmm. Right, Nkrumah right. Found his party because the party that he was first a member, I think, is the United Gold Coast Convention had invited him to be the secretary general. But then he found that they were just involved in negotiations to be a part of the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need to mobilize the masses and kick them right. out. And he found he couldn't operate that within the United mm -hmm. Gold Convention. And that's why he started the convention People's Party and led uh, to independence. But I say all this suggests that um, not many of the African leaders were willing to engage against the colonials and against capital to the extent that they actually needed to do. Right. Mm -hmm. right today, we find essentially every African country controlled by Western capital. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. Go back to the, the question asked earlier in terms of uh, Namibia. Namibia does not want to be cut off from Western capital. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. and, and to have what happened to Zimbabwe's economy happen in Namibia. They don't want wow. that. So they're mm -hmm. dependent on the World Bank, or the IMF, and now increasingly in recent years, uh, China. Even though yeah. all of them are sitting on the resources that are enriching these countries to industrialize. That mm. is yeah. hypocrisy. Right. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah true. That we need to up the consciousness of the young people in South in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Say we have the wealth, yet we are impoverished. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to get rid of all these leaders and we need starting forming African unions. You know, young people are not averse to this because, you know, they haven't been like presidents or prime ministers and enjoying all these symbols and right. luxuries, mm -hmm. luxuries of state. <laughs> you know, unity is a threat to these leaders because it means some of right. them would end up no longer being presidents, you see? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they have a lot to lose, but young people, especially if you can give them this argument. Why should any young person be drowning in the Mediterranean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trying to swim to Europe so they can go mm -hmm. and clean the streets, clean the bathrooms, work and in the right. mm -hmm. from right. the farms in Southern Italy, like enslaved laborers. Why? Right. When they have everything at home. That's the right. Go is your Miss Rula. Get rid of that. I think that is an argument that can be convincingly made to young people. In, in, I, think, you know? I, I think another thing they need to get rid of, uh, Milton, is those wigs that they borrowed from the British. <laughs> yeah, the wigs, the robes, <laughs> everything, all of it, especially the wigs. Because <laughs> the British look ridiculous in the oh wigs. Oh, my God. And the African no, but, but wait, judges look even more no, no, ridiculous. But wait, but wait, it means for an African to be willing to, and I'm glad you brought that up, because to me, things like that reveal a lot, mm -hmm. you know? 
if you are an African and you're willing to wear that blonde mm. wig, right? As because as a as a judge, you see this is what a judge. At least, <laughs> at least, why not make it a black wig? Exactly. A nice lock wig, you know, with <laughs> some Pan African colors on it. I can right. yes. Come yeah. on. But it oh, shows you, it shows you how colonized that mind mm -hmm. is. It shows you how far, far away the elite are. The elite are actually enemies of Africans. They really are. They're wow. enemies of ordinary Africans. I'm reading a, a books, two books, by by two two European socialists that are actually quite good. I want to recommend them. One is called African Socialism. Mm -hmm. And I also, uh, on, on the chat, I posted the title. And mm -hmm. yep. I shared that a little earlier. Bernard Brockway was a British anti-imperialist. And what is good about this is that he actually traveled to several African countries in the late 1950s and early 60s and met with many of the leaders and spoke to them, ah. particularly who are socialists, and interviewed them. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to read that, uh, that conversation from the uh, late 50s and 60s with people like Kwame Nkrumah, people with Modibo Keita. Mm. Uh, People like uh, Julius Nyerere, uh, people like Milton Obote. And then the second one is False Start in Africa by Rene oh. Dumont, who is a French anti imperialist socialist. And what I like, particularly about this book, he was an economist and an agronomist, is that he, and False Start in Africa, very appropriate title. And he meant, that if African countries were going to take that system that existed in Europe and just take that as a template and think they're going to use that to really develop Africa, big mistake. And mm. he wrote down wow. bit by bit throughout. And he pointed out, actually, they were fighting for comparable pay to the European wow. colonial masters and administrators. And he mm -hmm. said, okay, that means once they succeed in getting that comparable pay, they are now going to be enforcing the system by the masses. So even though yeah. they are involved in throwing out the Europeans, now the masses in Africa need to come and throw out the elite. And this was in 1962. Wow. wow. And it's as relevant today as it was, as it was when he wrote these words in 1962. And that is a challenge, you know? What? You know? Yeah, I mean, do, do you, that, that causes me to think of how we say here all the time about politics. Mm -hmm. We want a seat at the table. We want a seat right. at the table. That sounds like what people are saying. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah. I, I want to be equal to the people at the table who hold the power. They don't yeah. want to flip the table right, over right, right, and right. distribute the power and everything that's or on the table and, re, you know, yeah. replace the table or whatever to the people that are right. literally underneath the table. So that I think that's 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 a beautiful, beautiful um, point. One thing was, I want to take, um, take back to the conversation that you started today, you know, because okay. now I like connecting everything. Mm. So right. when, when we celebrate, when we look at Tulsa and only limit to the destruction done to black capital, we're essentially making that same argument. These were mm -hmm. people who were about to get seated on the table mm -hmm. and they were denied. But no, the table is the problem. <laughs> you know, we need to attack that table and right. say that's that's where the problem is. You know, <laughs> right? Is that to, be, the table? To, to, to sit on the table where the problem, where the scheming is planned, that's not really the solution. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when they can just remove your seat when they feel like it, right? No. But, 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 but one thing, um, uh, Milton, before we go, before we get off of South Africa, there's a few people in the chat that wanted um, to know what you thought about Julius um, Malema. Oh, I think compared to the ANC, he's night and day. Yeah. <laughs> As I said earlier, they would not be having this conversation had it not been for Malema. Mm. and economic freedom fighters. 
Now, um, Biko, to, to me, was the model for South Africa. Right. Mm -hmm. And Steve Biko was very deep, a very deep individual, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve Biko could have focused on himself and, you know, ended up practicing medicine and just focusing on being a doctor. Mm -hmm. But Steve Biko was one of the first to go back to the masses. He was a part of the National Student Union. The National Student Union was controlled by Europeans. And he said, you know, I came to realize that we, even though we say we oppose apartheid system, you know, we're in different fights because the so-called progressive liberal, you know, was still enjoying the comforts of the state. Mm and would never go all the way willing to lay down her or his life. But in the case of Africans, that was the case. And that's why he broke off with them and started promoting black consciousness. Mm -hmm. He understood the economy. And I think it's very tragic that today we don't have that sort of grounding in, uh, in knowledge, deep knowledge and in very few platforms to really educate our youth to that extent. So, and to the extent that we see the economic freedom fighters being successful, or Malema, is because of the foundation that was laid by a person like Steve Biko. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve Biko would have been the ideal leader. <clears throat> in South Africa. South Africa would be tremendously different today from the South Africa we have today has right. still not been killed mm. in, uh, <laughs> by the apartheid uh, 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 regime. He was only 30 years old and they realized how talented he was. Mm. You know? Will we have well, Steve Biko? Well, South Africa produced Steve Biko. So I don't see That's why. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let's go up to Mali. Um, yeah. When we have the what remaining time we have. So so far, Milton, um, give us a background on what's happening in Mali now. The latest updates that's trending is that, and you know, it was something that you was talking about absentee European landlords. Well, mm -hmm. France don't seem to be one of them. <laughs> they yeah. seem to always meddle in every. Uh, I mean, Macron, uh, he, he went to Rwanda. Yes. And, um, and and now, you know, now the French uh, military is saying that they're not going to op cooperate with the Mali uh, operations. So what's what's going on? there? And then you got the AU and ECOWAS mm -hmm. both suspending Mali and mm -hmm. it's a mess over there. Yeah. France right. is just like we send the troops. We're not absentee. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so France is really desperate and re-energize as a. Uh, uh, as a militaristic colonial power in Africa. And it's never really left, but it's expanding its zone now, you see? Mm. Um, the coup in Mali, first of all, the one last year in August, mm. that brought uh, uh, this guy, Asimi, mm -hmm. in the first place. That was, that was backed by, by, by France. It was backed by France because they had what was building toward a popular uprising in Mali. You know, remember the, the protests had gone on for months and months. The mm -hmm. uh, government uh, under President Koita uh, had been weakened. And, you know, so the military preempted what might have ended up being a, a, a popular revolution. Mm. You know? And at that time, I actually, I tweeted, I said this, because it was, there was a lot of celebration at that time. And I said, this is just, this is fictitious. This, re this military regime is going to be unpopular within six months to a year. And my tweet is still there. <laughs> <From last, laughs> there in August, because you just have to look at the elements. You know, don't be deceived by the euphoria. Mm -hmm. I said the same people celebrating today 
are going to be denouncing this military in a few months because the military is still going to be, the regime is going to be controlled by France. It's still going to be controlled by France. And sooner or later, mm. it will start revealing itself. You see? So your problem is not with your weak civilian government. Your problem is not with your military. Mm. Your problem is that you are operating a neo-colonial state. So whether it is Mali, right, right. whether it's Chad, whether it's Uganda, that is the problem. Everything we see are just manifestations of that fact, you know? So in Mali, now you have the same guy who himself set up this so-called transitional government. Mm -hmm. Now he comes in and throws out the person who was the transitional president and the transitional prime minister, you know, because he's been running the show Mm -hmm. Even as vice president, he's the he's the he's the soldier, right? And the soldier in Mali gets his directions from France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Chad, we saw the explicit manifestation when Idris Deby died on April twenty. His son succeeded him, and one of the first uh, world leaders to rush to the funeral and inauguration of the son was, mm -hmm. was Macron. Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron. Macron. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, nobody will threaten the stability of Chad. I thought the president of Chad is supposed to say that. But he is the president of Chad. You know, so it makes sense. Macron mm -hmm. is the president of Chad. Yeah. His son, no, Debbie, is just a character. Mohammed Debbie. Right. right. He's just a figurehead. But in Chad, the civilians are agitating, protesting in Chad and around the world in front of French embassies and missions. Mm -hmm. And now they're coordinating with other Africans. You know, some have contacted me. So I've gotten some Ugandans involved in their protests as well. Yeah. And now, ah. now they're seeing that all these common issues, you know, we all have a common enemy, which is the former colonial power who is today's neo-colonial power, whether it's France, whether it's Britain, whether it's US imperialism, you know, the US became a colonial power in Africa after colonialism mm. had ended. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. So that's the problem they face, but sooner or later, it can't be held back. Why? Because more than 60% of the population of the African continent under the age of 25, you can only contain them so long, so far. It's, it's just going to happen. It's, it's inevitable. You know, the population change and growth of the population had dictated that sooner or later, apartheid in South Africa would be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. The new colonial state in these individual African countries will also be overwhelmed. In Uganda, we are seeing the sign right now. You know, right. Right. millions of all these youth that came and they voted for Bobby Wine. And the guy is still pretending to be president because he controls the army and the police. And now he's trying to get a billion dollars from the IMF and World Bank. And, you know, we're agitating, of course. We are protesting and denouncing that. And it shows you who really runs the show in Africa. Right, so right. You have a person who stole election. Even the U.S. government said he stole it because the State Department put out a statement April 16, saying the elections were neither free nor fair. No fair. <laughs> They've never put it that explicit before. But now mm. he's about to allow the World Bank to give him a billion dollars alone <laughs> and the u.s is the major shareholder in the world bank mm -hmm. so through it means the u.s approved of it because that's right he is the u.s man in that part of african real estate you know but, mm. and you know the 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 thing that we're hearing throughout all of the countries that we've talked about so far tonight is 
the the agitation of the youth and the uprisings that are building in all of these countries uh, that's being fueled by youth malcontent as as they should be um, uh, as they should feel with these comprador led governments yes. uh, neo colonial governments in African nations and I think we want to pivot over to T Gray. Okay, yeah, because we got like like ten minutes left. Yeah, so let so that there is a the the situation in Tigray has uh, evolved, I guess, devolved. What is going on in the uh, in, in the Tigray region, Milton, and why should we be concerned about well, that? Well, we also got to add too before you answer that, Milton, is that we just talked about the United States um, uh, backing um, uh, Museveni, right? But, right, Museveni, yeah, Museveni, uh-huh. but yet. Their oldest ally, Ethiopia, right? The United States just slapped sanctions on. So, right. what, what's that all about? All right. Okay. Very good point. Uh, at, at Ethiopia, I think what they fear, and this is the thing, <laughs> they always get a little more serious when, uh, when it becomes quite clear that it's about to explode into a. Uh, a situation that they cannot control. Mm-hmm. You see, uh, like uh, what happened in, in in Rwanda, for example. What happened in Congo? Mm-hmm. These were uh, situations that the U.S. essentially promoted and encouraged until it got out of hand. You know, and then they're running around saying, "Oh, we want to try to resolve this." The massacres in Rwanda, the genocide in 1994, would never have happened had the U.S. not allowed its puppet, Museveni, to invade Rwanda on October 1st, 1990. Mm. And then that war that lasted four years exacerbated the ethnic uh, combustibility between Hutu and Tutsi. And essentially, the U.S. using uh, Museveni as the, the the puppet wanted to displace French influence from Rwanda and uh, impose a English influence. You know, U.S. and Britain. You know, English speaking influence. Mm-hmm. And from there, start. Uh, plucking, stealing the resources from Rwanda's neighbor, which is Eastern Congo. Mm. Perhaps the most mineral rich part of the continent. And then of course, you can't control once you unleash you know, weapons. So perhaps they had not foreseen that we could have a situation like the genocide that happened when the plane carrying the president was shot down, you know? That may not have been initially in part of the U.S. equation. It certainly was in Paul Kagame's equation. Right, right, right. 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 That was the only way he could have an excuse to seize power. Mm -hmm. Because he had signed an agreement Mm -hmm. for elections. And elections, you know, the Hutu majority would have won. So he needed utter chaos to give him the rationale that, oh, I'm here to stop, you know, genocide, which he himself has sparked. Right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. But now, when we go back and we look at uh, Ethiopia, we see the fighting with Tigray, and then we see the involvement of Eritrea. Mm. Then I see the U.S. being concerned that something explosive, similar to Rwanda or Congo, uh, could occur, and that is why they would be able to uh, consider these sanctions on Ethiopia. And you ask the question, why not Uganda? Uganda, they see it as a manageable uh, neo-colonial relationship. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. At the same time, if they if one of the them happen to be listening to your show, I would like to suggest to them that the youth in Uganda 
have really had it. They're coming to their limit because the guy is afraid that there could be a popular uprising. So right. he's, he's kidnapping young people randomly. People are picked from the streets. People are picked from their homes, arrested in front of their parents, a real state of terror. Wow. wow. And this has been widely covered in the New York Times, the, the BBC, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Finally, you know, after we'd been tweeting and demanding and denouncing them for not covering this kidnapping, torture and murder. So some have been released, severely tortured. Some, their bodies have been found after they've been killed. Mm. So when you have a situation like this, this is the kind of conditions that at one point existed in Rwanda before the explosion of massacres in 1994. Wow. So you're thinking, oh, in Uganda, we can manage it. You might end up getting another rude surprise there. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. They're using that as their calculation of still to be accommodating to with Museveni and maybe even give him another billion dollars uh, from the World Bank and IMF, as I pointed out. Now, in Ethiopia, I think the balance is, is also a bit combustive. I think, had it been just the central government and Ethiopia dealing with Tigray, I think they might have resolved that crisis in a different way. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the parties might have come to their senses that this is unwinnable. This is going to be destructive for, for both sides. And that may have been the rationale the leadership in the Tigray region were using in how they were conducting themselves with the central government, the federal government. Now, by introducing Eritrea as a partner, mm -hmm. literally sandwiching Tigray, that changed the equation, of course. Wow. And now the central government had no incentive to even want to negotiate any of the differences they had because they saw mm -hmm. that they have military superiority, which, of course, could be a mistake. But now, because once you open that, that road, you know, there's no going back. And now you have a situation where we're getting all these reports of the atrocities against civilians in Tigray, and reportedly, most of it committed, not really by soldiers from the central government, by from soldiers from Eritrea, right? Hmm. You know, a neighboring country, which was mm -hmm. in become part of the conflict by the central government, because Eritrea had fought some wars in the past over the border with Ethiopia, right? And Eritrea had been defeated, and most of the soldiers who were instrumental in the Ethiopian victory were from Tigray. So wow. now Eritrea is looking at an element of revenge, not so much against these soldiers, because th that, you know, that war has been over for quite some time. So they're collectively punishing you know, the people who certainly had no direct role <laughs> in the war you know, because that war ended a long time ago. Right. And seeking mm. retribution against them. So that is why we have a potentially explosive situation in, in Tigray. And the, 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 Tigray, the Tigrayans are very adept at guerrilla warfare, you see? Mm, wow. They're the ones who are instrumental in overthrowing the Mengistu regime, the military government that overthrew Hela Selassie in 74, mm. and then was in power until 91. Yeah, military government overthrown by an alliance of Tigrayan fighters, guerrillas, and Eritrean guerrillas. So at that time, they were actually allies, you know? Wow. Yeah, so I say this to say that if the Ethiopian central government and its ally Eritrea think they can suppress a Tigray, and conquer and rule. The Emperor Selassie was not able to do that. The military government of Mengizu was not able to do that. 
So why should history be any different? Right. Which, wow. Which means down the line, we know there's potential for even more escalation of violence. With now people in Tigray wanting to exact revenge for what is being done to them. And here's where if you had a a strong African Union presence, you know, they could make a difference. But, you know, a club can only be as good as its members, right? That's right. And if you have the leadership of the club, neo-colonial presidents, you see, that's a big problem. Yes. <laughs> I've been having conversations now with many other, you know, Pan-Africans, including young, young, young Pan-Africans. And when I suggest this idea, I find that many have already been thinking about the same thing, <laughs> which is that we need to have a People's African Union. And it can be created. Mm -hmm. All these conscious Africans on the continent and in the diaspora can create this organization, which can actually become even much more effective than the African Union itself. Wow. Wow. That's well, a beautiful idea. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, Milton. Uh, we're, we're coming up there. But as always, I mean, oh, man, I, I mean, so many people in the chat is like, Milton dropping that knowledge. <laughs> yep. I mean, you know, and, and you know, it's it's something, you know, this this is conversations that we must have. So we thank you, Milton, man, once oh, again. I I appreciate you know when there's a there was a show I used to go on on Voice of America called Straight Talk Africa. Mm -hmm. And whenever I tried to communicate with the young people in Uganda, whenever my section came, I was being interviewed on that show. The TV station in Uganda would mute me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Wow. So I'm glad you want to hear the truth. We have outlets like this. Thank you so much, sister and brother. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Listen, y'all, thank you so much for joining. Uh, the Last Dope Intellectual is premiering in a minute or so. Please check out Milton Alamadi's Patreon. I gave you the link to uh, his Patreon African History Club. Amazing content there, just as amazing as you get here. Thank Every you. month, Milton, again, thank you so much. Thank we'll have you. more questions about the imprint of imperialism on the continent of Africa and beyond the first Friday of next month. Thank take you, care, brother. You. Peace. Thank you so much. And take care of you all. You all be good to each other. As the eternal chairman, Fred Hampton, always says, peace, if you're willing to fight for it. And we got to fight for it. Because it ain't cheap. That's right. So y'all good take good care and we'll talk to you soon. Shaba. I don't know. I just felt like saying that. <laughs> I think it was appropriate. It was appropriate. <laughs>